Good morning, um, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak um, on a topic which I have a, a great deal of interest, so it's always fun to, to talk about. Um, what I want to do this morning is to talk generally about dark trading, and I had planned to talk for about 40 minutes, um, but I'm happy to take questions as we go through and to adapt and, and shorten what I have to say depending on, on what your interests are. So what I wanted to do is generally talk about dark trading, what it is, and why regulators both here and overseas are concerned about it. Then I wanted to talk a little bit about a research paper that um, I've been working on with one of my co-authors, who's also here this morning, uh, looking at the impact of dark trading on price discovery in the Australian market. And I'll talk about what we do in that paper and what we learn about how dark trading influences the quality of price formation. And then I also want to spend a little bit of time at the end just touching on some of the recent regulatory changes and what that they might mean for the buy side. So first off, what is dark trading? It's kind of unfortunate that we ended up with this term dark trading and dark pools because it sounds all very sinister and that need not be the case. Uh, essentially dark trading is just any trading that takes place without pre-trade transparency. Okay, so we don't see the orders interacting in the order book in the way we do on the, on the exchange. So traditionally, when we think about dark trading, what that is uh, referring to is the large block negotiated trades that have always existed in markets all around the world. Uh, and they provided a mechanism for institutions to execute trades without price impact and to minimise information linkage. But the term dark trading also captures the idea of broker internalisation, so where the brokers are taking client flow and matching it against their own book, um, and also simply client matching. So if a broker has two clients wanting to trade the same stock in opposite directions, simply crossing that up and reporting it to the market. Again, something that's happened uh, forever. What is new in, the, in the, the dark trading world is the notion of a dark pool. So a dark pool is essentially just an automated system that does what brokers used to do manually. So it systematises the process. Um, a dark pool also means that orders can be resting away from the market, so sitting in an electronic limit order book, not disclosed to anyone, okay? um, and allowing uh, those dark orders to interact with one another. And finally, we can have hidden orders on exchanges. So orders that are sitting in the exchange book, but not visible to um, anyone in the market. So in Australia, um, the trading rules are obviously dictated by the market integrity rules, and generally trading is expected to take place on one of the two exchanges. But there are a couple of exceptions, uh, pre-trade transparency exceptions. And they are the, uh, the block and portfolio crossing rules. So block trades, obviously trades over a million dollars, um, and portfolio crossings, lines of stock over more than five million dollars for at least 10 stocks. So again, not new, they've always um, been allowed to occur. Trades at or within the spread, are essentially trades in the dark uh, for any size. Okay, so these are the traditional priority crossings um, which have always existed on ASX, but now there's a range of mechanisms in which trades at or within the spread can be executed. So dark trading in Australia really began to change back in mid-2010 when ASX launched uh, a couple of new facilities, um, Centrepoint, which is a dark pool, so it's a separate electronic limit order book where orders rest in that pool um, and match at the midpoint of the bid-ask spread on their um, displayed order book. And they also enhance the priority crossing to allow those to occur at the midpoint as well. So when traditionally priority crossings had to occur at the bid or the ask, they can now occur at the midpoint. Um, Chiex, when they launched, introduced a hidden order type and at that time, it was anticipated that ASIC would impose a $20,000 minimum threshold on dark trading. Uh, and so when Chiex launched, their hidden order type was launched with that restriction. Um, and that was lifted in May of 2012. So now we see hidden orders, or actually we don't see hidden orders resting on the, on the Chiex order book, um, executing. Perhaps the biggest change, though, has been uh, the launch um, and development of broker-operated crossing systems. Okay, so according to the stats on ASIC's website, there's currently 18 crossing systems operating in Australia, um, operated by 15 different brokers. So some of the large brokers are operating two crossing systems. Um, and a crossing system is essentially just a, an automated mechanism for matching orders away from the exchange. 
There's quite a big variation in the nature of the crossing systems that are operated by different brokers. Some of them are in fact dark pools that allow waters to rest um, and sit in the dark. Others are merely just crossing engines that match up client orders. So they might put an order on the exchange book and if they have a counterparty client come along that can trade against that order, they'll pull that order out of the exchange book and match it up and report to the market. Um, all of these things have led to very significant changes in the way dark trades are done in Australia. Uh, the really big change has been the change in the size of the orders being traded in the dark. So historically, um, if we look at trades below block size, back in 2008, those trades had an average size of about $150,000. So that reflected the fact that there was manual processes involved and it wasn't worthwhile um, doing those things for small orders. Today, the average uh, non-block dark trade um, is about the same size as an order on the exchange. So we're talking around seven or $8,000. Okay, so the dark trading facilities are not necessarily offering block liquidity anymore. Um, the other thing that's changed about the, the dark trading market and the broker operated crossing systems is when these systems were launched, they were typically just systems designed to match client order flow. Okay, so doing what brokers have always done, broked, uh, crossed orders for their clients. Now many of these crossing <laughs> systems have evolved to be much more market-like. Okay, so they might take orders from other brokers um, and really operate in the way that we would anticipate a market to operate. Uh, but currently they're not regulated as such. Uh, they're not regulated as markets, they're simply regulated um, in the way that, same way as brokers are regulated under their AFSLs. So to give you a sense of how that's, uh, those changes have impacted what dark trading looks like in the Australian market. So this chart shows us that the grey bars are essentially the total dollar value traded um, on the ASX. And we're looking at the period from February of 2008 through to the launch of ChaiX in October 2011. Okay, so we wanted to stop, this, this comes from our dark trading and price discovery paper, we wanted to stop the study when ChaiX launched because we want to really understand the impact of dark trading. We don't want that to get mixed up with what happens when the market fragments from a, a displayed liquidity point of view. But you can see um, over the period of time that we're looking at, at the total level of dark trading, so this line up the top, so that's both block and non-block trades, really has not shown any considerable trend. Okay, it's fluctuated um, around 20 to 25%. So contrast that with what you read in the media, um, the media is constantly telling us that there's been an explosion of dark pool activity in Australia. Um, clearly that's not borne out by the data. Um, what has changed though, as I said, is the way in which orders are executed. Um, and if we look at the split um, of this trading activity into below block dark and block dark, so stuff over a million dollars and stuff that's not over a million dollars, you can see that we are starting to see some changes. So there's been a pick up in the level of non-block dark activity and a drop off in dark, uh, block liquidity. So dark trading facilities are no longer providing that block or much less providing that block trading mechanism. And if we looked at those statistics out until now, you'd see a continued divergence in those two lines. So the, the level of activity um, in non-block size in the dark is growing. Um, and block trading activity is, is stagnating. Um, but still, we don't see this explosion in dark activity that's talked about in the media. Uh, so you can see over this period of time, I've just marked um, where we've seen new crossing systems come online. So there's been a big growth in the number of crossing systems after about 2009. Um, and then we have the ASX launch at centre point in mid-2010 and that's really where we start to see this divergence in the way dark trades are being executed. Just to give you a sense of how that's split across different stocks, so we're looking here at the All Ords Index um, and we've split that out into four groups based on stock size and you can see that uh, most of the dark liquidity below block size is in the, the larger stocks. So why are regulators concerned about dark trading? Um, I'm sure in this room I don't need to tell you about the benefits of, of dark trading, you're already well aware of them. Um, historically, you're being offered block liquidity. 
Uh, that allows you to manage market impact costs and reduce information leakage. Okay, so trying to maintain your information, get the trade done before the market becomes aware of the position that you want to enter into or get out of. Um, those benefits are very clear and obvious. Um, there's also the potential for time priority for some clients. So a large broker um, who has multiple clients potentially is allowed to avoid the time priority requirements of the market by executing his own client's orders away from the market. So potentially getting faster execution for that broker's clients. Uh, the other benefit is uh, for the brokers um, is that um, exchange fees are lower for reporting a trade to the market than executing a trade on the market. Um, so there's some, some cost savings there for the broker, uh, but they typically have not been passed on to the end investor. But what are the risks? Uh, given how much attention this issue has got, clearly those benefits must be offset by something. Uh, and there's a range of risks. Uh, the primary risk is about the impact that it might have on the quality of liquidity and price formation in the market. So if you think about an exchange that's a monopoly, that gets all order flow, all the liquidity coming into the order book, you'd expect very tight spreads, uh, very deep order books. Now fragment that across 20 different trading venues. Um, there's clearly a potential for reduced liquidity. Um, and the fact that we have opportunities to gain benefit from trading away from the market means that there's also a reduced incentive for actually placing your limit orders in the market. Uh, so uh, a real risk of reduced liquidity in the order book. Uh, fragmentation, clearly, as I said, if you're splitting orders across 20 venues, it becomes a much more complex process to try to find liquidity. Um, in the old days, I guess your options were ASX or use your broker to find block liquidity for you. Now the broker has to have sophisticated technology to route the orders across different venues to try to seek out the liquidity. This is likely to lead to increased bid-ask spreads if we've got less liquidity in the order book um, and also a less efficient price formation process. If we're now only observing a fraction of the order flow in the market and some of it's being kept, kept away in the dark and only being revealed after the trade, then the quality of the price formation process may be harmed. There's also some concerns about the process and mechanisms actually associated with um, the crossing systems and, and dark trading venues. Um, because in Australia, crossing systems are not regulated as markets, it means there's no obligation on those crossing system operators to disclose information about how orders are matched. Uh, so on the exchange, we know orders are matched according to price and time priority. In the crossing systems, that may or may not be the case. They may give uh, different uh, priority to different types of orders, uh, but there's no obligation to disclose that. Clearly, as a, a buy-side firm, you can ask those questions, uh, but I think a, a, a more desirable environment would be that that would be transparent to everyone in the market. Um, there's also a reduced level of monitoring and surveillance. So we know ASIC is responsible for all surveillance of the market these days. Um, from ASX and CHIX, they get a data feed which shows them every order and every trade executed in the market. Um, so they're able to go back and examine trading activity, examine the interaction of orders, um, and determine whether there's any unusual activity. In a crossing system, all they observe is the trade reports. Okay, so they, can't, they have no line of sight into how orders are being matched in the broker crossing systems. Um, so the level of surveillance is, is very much reduced. Uh, there's also concern, both in Australia and in other markets, that although uh, crossing systems and exchanges compete with one another, they operate on quite different playing fields. So in Australia, the issue of market licensing is a big issue. So the fact that exchanges are licensed as markets, crossing operators are not. Um, and the other big difference is, as an exchange, the ASX and CHIX are obligated to take order flow from anyone that sends order flow to those markets. The crossing systems have the option of discriminating about who can send orders to that market. And clearly that's a desirable feature. If you're a, a large buy-side firm, you'd like to trade in a pool that's only available to large buy-side firms. Um, but the, it, it changes the, platform, the, the playing field on which exchanges and crossing systems can operate. 
Uh, so moving on to think about uh, the research that we've done. Uh, so this is joint work with Talos Putnins from UTS. What we wanted to do in this paper was to understand what is the impact of dark trading on price discovery. Okay, so that's one of the issues that regulators are concerned about. So we want to try and understand that dynamic. We want to understand whether there's any validity in the concern from regulators about the quality of price formation. So the, the highlights first. So our key findings are that aggregate price discovery um, is impeded and information um, become, or prices become less efficient as order flow moves to the dark. Um, the order flow that moves to the dark is generally less informed than, that what, than what remains on the lit order book. Um, there's an increase in adverse selection risk, meaning that there's greater probability of trading with someone informed in the lit market, leading to increased spreads and also higher price impacts in the market. Interestingly, we find quite different results for block trades versus non-block trades. Okay, so we find no evidence that block trades have any harm on the price formation process in the market. So getting into a little bit of the detail in terms of what we do, we're looking at stocks in the All Ordinaries Index, um, as I mentioned before, between February um, 08 and October 2011, during normal trading hours. And we're, because TriX doesn't exist yet, we're obviously only looking at ASX data. Um, and what we do is we use the trading flags um, on the data to classify trades into three categories. We've got lit trades, so those that are done on the limit order book. Um, we've got below block dark trades, which are priority crossings, um, centre point trades and centre point priority crossings. And then the block trades, which are blocks and portfolio specials. Um, essentially, we do a lot of things in this paper, and I'm only going to talk about a couple of them. Uh, but our approach is that we want to come up with a bunch of measures of price discovery, and there's a lot of work in the academic literature which gives us background on how to do that. So for every stock on every date, we're going to estimate a series of different price discovery measures. Uh, the ones I'm going to talk about today are the aggregate price discovery measures, so essentially how informationally efficient are the prices, um, and then also a measure of price discovery share. So we want to identify where the price discovery is coming from. Is it from the lit trades? Is it from the dark trades? Is it from um, the quotes? Or is it from the trade prices? And then we want to take each of those measures and look at how they relate to the level of dark trading in the market, both block and non-block. So we run some panel regressions to understand understand the association between those variables. So the measures of aggregate price discovery that we look at are essentially trying to understand how efficient are the prices in a traditional academic sense. So do prices follow a random walk? Um, and we look at that by considering the autocorrelation of returns, so uh, variance ratios and return predictability. So obviously a price which is more predictable is less efficient. So we look at those three measures and we look at how they correlate with our block and non-block trading measures. Uh, so the first uh, three numbers that you see there are telling us the association between non-block trading in the dark and each of those informational efficiency measures. And what we find is that when we increase the level of non-block dark trading, we see a deterioration of the quality of information efficiency. Okay, so all of those informational efficiency measures go up. Um, meaning that the quality of the price discovery has declined. Interesting though, interestingly though, when we look at the block trades, um, we in fact find the opposite result. So block trades seem to be enhancing the quality of the price discovery process. So thinking about that, if we take out block trades that maybe will cause short-term volatility in the prices just because of um, their sheer size, when we pull those out, um, and execute those in the dark, they're achieving the objective you'd like, that they're not hindering the price discovery process. We don't expect those things to be linear though. We expect, um, I like many others have often said, some dark trading is good, but too much dark trading is probably going to be bad. And we want to try and understand what is the tipping point? At what point does dark trading lose its benefit and start to hinder the quality of the price formation process. 
So to do that, what we did was we, looking at the same types of regressions, but instead of including the, the variables measuring um, um, uh, dark trading, what we did was put them into buckets so we could find out at what level um, do we start to see a change in the direction of the association between dark trading and informational efficiency. And that's what you can see on this chart here. We've got our three informational efficiency measures. You can see that the, the trend in them is, is fairly similar. What this picture shows us is that um, on the bottom axis here is the uh, percentage of uh, dark trading done in non-block size. Okay? And on this axis is our measure of informational efficiency. And an increase in the, that number means a decline in the quality of, of informational efficiency. So you can see at low levels of dark trading, we're in fact getting improvements in the quality of informational efficiency. So down in this area, dark trading is enhancing price discovery. Once we get up around the 10% mark, when we control for other factors in the stock, what we see is that um, informational efficiency has got to the point where it's now worse than where it was with the zero level of dark trading. Okay, so, and as we uh, get higher and higher levels of dark trading, the quality of the price formation process declines even more. So our conclusion uh, from this is that some dark trading is good, but when we get beyond about 10% of dark trading in non-block size, um, we're starting to see some harm in the quality of price formation. We do the same thing with block trades, um, and you can see similar picture, but things are shifted way out to the right. Okay, so we're getting improvements in the quality of price formation up until about 15%. And it's not until we're out at about the 40, 45% level that we're getting to the point which is equivalent to zero. Okay, so it seems like you can, the market can bear very high levels of block trading without having any harm on price discovery. Um, the other thing we do is to um, try to break down where price discovery is taking place and how that's changing um, as the level of dark trading changes. There's a couple of measures in the academic literature that, that tell us how to do that. Um, they're essentially what they're trying to do is capture the speed with which new information is incorporated into the price and what the mechanism is for that happening. Um, I won't go into the details of um, how that's done, uh, but we do two tests um, when we're looking at this breakdown. So the first is we want to understand how much we learn about prices from the trade prices versus how much we learn from the quotes. Um, and the other is how much do we learn from the reporting of lit trades versus the reporting of dark trades. Now the reason we're interested in understanding this is talking to particularly brokers in the market, we often hear them say things like, post-trade transparency is pre-trade transparency for the next trade. We don't need to see the order book, we don't need to see the quotes, we know everything we need to know based on the trade price. And so essentially what we're doing is testing that idea. We're saying, do we learn additional information about the prices from quotes, or do we just need the trades? Um, and the answer is, uh, to their proposition, that it's not correct. Okay? Post-trade transparency is not adequate. We can learn a lot about prices from the quotes. Okay, so seeing the order book is helpful. Um, so our price discovery share measures show us that uh, mid-quotes impound, in fact, more information than trades do. Okay, so if we were going to take any information away, the thing that would be um, more important to leave is the quotes, not the, the trades. Um, the mid-quotes are less noisy than trade prices. Um, and the other important thing is that lit trades impound more information than dark trades. Okay, so we're learning a lot more about prices and price discovery from the trades that take place on the market rather than in, in dark pools. So we then take the same approach as we did with the aggregate price discovery measures and want to understand how does the price discovery share change as we change the level of block and dark trading. Um, and what we find is that as the level of non-block dark trading increases, our mid quotes become faster at reflecting new information. Okay, so the quotes are um, more valuable when there's dark trading. Um, and trades prices become less noisy compared to the, the mid quotes. Again, we're finding this result that block trades are having no effect on this. Okay, so 
seeing a block trade report, or uh, sorry, growth in the level of block trading doesn't affect the relative importance of quotes versus trades. Um, and finally, when we look at uh, the contribution of lit versus dark trades for both block and non-block trading, we see increases in the role of dark trading in impounding new information into the market as the level of dark trading increases. So what this suggests is that we're actually losing information from the market, losing information about prices when there's a shift or an increase in the level of dark trading. So our conclusions from all of this analysis, plus some other stuff that I haven't talked about, is that um, order flow that migrates to the dark is generally less informed than that what stays on the book. Um, and, but it's not entirely uninformative. Okay, so by taking out some of these orders from the market, we are decreasing the quality of the price formation. Um, as order flow migrates to the dark, price discovery deteriorates, the contribution of quotes to price discovery increases, uh, the contribution of dark trades to price discovery increases, and we see greater adverse selection and increases in the bid-ask spread. So what does all of this mean in terms of how we should think, be thinking about dark trading from a regulatory perspective? Um, what it says to me is that clearly some dark trading is beneficial for the market. So any regulations need to be sure not to remove those benefits that dark trading can offer. Um, not all dark trading has the same impact, so we need to be particularly cautious about what we, how we deal with the block trades, uh, because they're not appearing to cause any harm to the market whatsoever. So regulation needs to very carefully consider the differences in the types of dark trading that exist, um, and also carefully consider how to avoid harmful levels. Okay, if high levels of dark trading are bad, what we want to do is make sure that there's opportunities for dark trading to occur, but to have a mechanism for if the level of dark trading gets too high, that we have a way to, to pull that back. So what regulation is in place or forthcoming on this front? Um, so ASIC's obviously been active at looking at these issues over the last few years. Um, and at the end of last year, they announced some new rules on a range of issues, dark trading and also on algo trading, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, those new rules for dark trading take effect on the 26th of May um, this year. And I think these changes are quite significant and really will change the dynamics of dark trading in the market. And um, the first change relates to the block trades. So they've changed the threshold for what is required in order to do a block trade in the market. Uh, traditionally, it's been a million dollars. The new measure or the new rules will determine the threshold based on the stock size. So there'll be three thresholds. A um, million dollars for the largest stocks, so maybe the top 20-ish stocks still have a million dollar threshold. $500,000 for the next tier of stocks. And the vast majority of stocks will have a $200,000 threshold for block trading. So what that means is it should be, uh, well, it's easier to, well, possible now, to do a block trade for $200,000 in most stocks. Um, and so hopefully we'll make it easier to uh, find block liquidity um, in the market. The other very significant change is the introduction of a meaningful price improvement requirement for non-block dark trades. Okay, so for anything that doesn't meet the block threshold, up until this point in time, those trades can occur at or within the spread. The new requirement for meaningful price improvement means that to execute in the dark, um, the trade will need to offer a better price than what's currently being displayed in the market. Okay, economically meaningful, uh, refers to one tick size, so the minimum price increment in the market is um, economically meaningful, or the midpoint of the spread. So a, if the stock is trading at its minimum tick size, so a stock like Telstra, which always trades with its spread at one cent, meaningful price improvement for Telstra will be half a cent. Okay? The reason why this change is so significant, I think, is because, well, for two reasons. One, it really changes the incentives for trading in the dark. Okay, up until now, it's been possible to trade in the dark by free riding off the prices which are being offered in the market. So simply to step ahead of someone else who has been willing to display their order to the market. Uh, with these new rules, that won't be possible. If you want to trade in the dark and get priority over other investors who have been willing to display their liquidity in the market, you need to be prepared to offer a better price. Um, so that changes the dynamic and the incentives for the use of the dark. 
The, the second reason why this is significant, I think, is it will have a dampening pressure on the level of dark trading in the market. So I will expect around the 26th of May that we'll see a drop off in the level of dark trading in non-block stocks, um, or non-block trades rather. And given that we think high levels of dark trading are harmful, that shift will hopefully address those price discovery issues. And um, the other things that um, ASIC did at the end of last year was announce uh, two task forces, uh, one on dark trading and one on high frequency trading. Um, and those task forces have been reviewing um, the conduct of dark pools and also high frequency traders and assessing whether there's need for further regulation to um, um, ensure market integrity and, and market quality. Uh, so at the time ASIC announced that they would uh, um, provide the details of those reviews in quarter one this year, so we can expect something shortly. Um, and the other thing that's been going on is that the Treasury has been doing a review of market licensing. Um, that market licensing review closed in February of this year, so again, um, you would expect a, a, an outcome of that to be fairly imminent. So that review was essentially looking at the question of how should crossing systems be operated? Should they require a market license in the same way as a exchange does? Um, or should there be additional market integrity rules imposed on the operators of crossing systems? Um, and clearly that sort of review will address some of the other issues that I raised in terms of the transparency of the trading process in crossing systems um, and some of the supervision issues also. And there were a bunch of other market, stra uh, market structure changes announced by ASIC at the end of last year, uh, which have phased in over a period of time. Um, so of course the other hot topic um, at the moment is high frequency trading and algorithmic trading. Um, and the, the series of changes that were announced at the end of last year essentially are designed to address some of the concerns around that. Um, so the first is um, new extreme trading, rule, um, trading rules um, imposed by the operators. So that's essentially um, circuit breakers that take effect if there's very large price swings in a stock. So trying to address the concerns associated with events like the flash crash in the US. Uh, where the exchange has to halt trading very briefly um, in the event of uh, a large price swing. So those rules came into effect at the end of last year. Um, the second element of that is to have controls at the broker level or the market participant level. Um, so brokers will need to have direct control over any trading algorithms that come into the market via their pipes um, and that includes a kill switch. So if there's unusual activity on those um, pipes the broker has to have the capacity to kill that algorithm. Um, but there's a long lead time on that, so not until June of next year that takes effect. Um, and the last thing is some additional data requirements uh, for reporting um, to ASIC. So things like identifying um, algorithms um, in the trading data um, and also the trading venues for, for dark pools. So all of those changes I think will go to addressing some of the issues that have been raised around algorithmic trading. So you've been a very quiet audience. <laughs> or oh, maybe I've just been talking too quickly. Uh, but I think we've got a couple of minutes if there's um, questions. 